The last world war was not simply a war fought between the Allies and the Axis. It was part of an ancient battlefield of a galactic war. With the Anunnaki sponsoring the Nazis and the Pleiadians on the side of the American and British Empire, fought once again for control of planet Earth, while using its unsuspecting armies as pawns in their interstellar conflict. The conventional view of the outbreak of World War II is one in which Germany and Japan just happened to emerge as fascist military superpowers at the same time and decided to join forces and take over the entire world. In this view it is coincidental that Japan would build an imperial fleet and become an invincible naval power and that Germany would simultaneously develop a fearsome blitzkrieg capable of using coordinated air and ground forces. Even at face value, this hypothesis seemed absurd to some. Such grand historical coincidences rarely occur and usually turn out of the result of malicious long-range planning and that seems to be the case with World War II. Now a growing group of researchers into the circumstances of Hitler's rise to power and a sudden coordinated emergence of militant fascism all over the world. See the roots of World War II in an extremely new and more disturbing light. Could it have been decided well in advance, at some very high level, that Japan would take over Asia and Australia, while Germany and Italy would divide up Europe, Russia and North and South America? The following scenario it is argued, is the once hidden true story of World War II. After World War I, at the end of 1919, ex-corporal Adolf Hitler met Dietrich Eckhart in Munich. Eckhart was a sophisticated and wealthy publisher. He was also an occultist in the highest circle of the Thule Society, an esoteric group founded in Germany in 1918. He had been a student of Russian metaphysician Gerd Chief, who I suspect was a new Naki. Because of his admiration for Eckhart, Hitler joined the society. The Thule Society held regular seances during which the attendees reportedly communicated with demons and attempted to invoke the Antichrist. During one such session, Eckhart believed that he was told by his spirit guide that he would have the honor of training the Corning Great One, the incarnation of the Antichrist. He soon became convinced that Adolf Hitler was the chosen one, and he took him under his wing. There can be no doubt that Eckhart trained Hitler in techniques of self-confidence, self-projection, persuasive oratory, body language and discursive sophistry. Using these capabilities Hitler became a powerful speaker, able to mesmerize and excite vast audiences. He learned to start his speeches softly, and then build to a peak of pretended frenzied fervor accompanied by animated gesticulations. He also developed a hypnotic power over individuals. Eckhart it is reported, also passed on to Hitler all his occult knowledge of ritual and sexual black magic. According to Trevor Ravenscroft in The Spear of Destiny regarding the practices of the Thule Society, indulgence in the most sadistic rituals awakened penetrating vision into the workings of evil intelligences and bestowed phenomenal magical powers. At the completion of this training, Hitler claimed to be born anew filled with new strength and the resolve he would need to carry out his mandate. Eckhart died three years later in 1923, and reportedly said on his deathbed, Follow Hitler. He will dance, but it is I who have called the tune. I have initiated him into the secret doctrine, 
opened his centers of vision and given him the means to communicate with the powers. Do not mourn for me, I shall have influenced history more than any German. The following year, Hitler dedicated the second volume of his book, Mein Kampf, to Eckhart. Eckhart's claim that he had given to Hitler the means to communicate with the powers has been interpreted to mean that Hitler could now solicit advice from those same entities that A. Lister Crowley referred to as the secret chiefs, since Eckhart was basically a disciple of Crowley, who was also a new Nazi. Crowley, who was sometimes referred to as the Great Beast, was the head of the infamous occult organization, Order of the Golden Dawn in London. In late 1919, the Thule Society became more political, and was instrumental in starting the German Workers' Party under the leadership of Thuleist Karl Hara. In 1920, this evolved into the National Socialist German Workers' Party, commonly known as the Nazi Party, drawing its membership from the top echelons of the Thule Society, including Rudolf Hess, Heinrich Himmler, Alfred Rosenberg, Adolf Hitler, these great Aryan leaders, really, look at these people, none of them have blonde hair or blue eyes, these people were brainwashed by the Anunnaki. And some I suspect were Anunnaki hybrids. In The Gods of Eden, William Bramley says, Dot the Thule was a society of assassins, it held secret courts and condemned people to death. It is likely that many victims murdered by the district command had been condemned earlier in the secret courts of the Thule. The conception of the swastika flag adopted by the Nazis is attributed to Dr. Friedrich Krohn, a member of Thule. But Hitler's occult training was not yet complete. After the death of a cut, as if on a schedule, Another even more powerful teacher came into his life. Karl Hauschofer was a 54-year-old professor of political science at Munich University when Hitler entered jail in 1924. While with German intelligence in Japan before the war, Hauschofer had been initiated into the ultra-secret Green Dragon Society, one of only three Europeans to have ever been granted that honor. There he was taught how to develop the mastery of the etheric body, or the time organism. This training apparently gave him precognitive powers and he was able to predict the dates and exact times of enemy attacks, the number of casualties, and bombardment patterns while a general during the war. We now know this as remote viewing. Consequently, Hauschofer emerged with an illustrious war record and became well known throughout Germany. Hauschofer, like Eckhart, was convinced that he had found the savior of the German people that he had been seeking. Hauschofer subsequently visited Hitler frequently in his plush cell at the Landsberg fortress with books and papers under his arm, and helped him to write what became the Bible of the Nazi movement, Mein Kampf, virtually dictating long passages. Hauschofer's domination of the entire philosophical basis of the Nazi movement was solidified when he founded the Luminous Lodge of Real Society in Berlin in 1920. This eventually became the inner circle of the Thule Society, and reportedly attracted members from other occult movements in Europe, as well as from Tibet, Japan, India, Kashmir, Turkey and Ceylon. Its most inspirational book was The Coming Race by Edward bulwer -Lytton, a story about an underground utopian civilization where the inhabitants flew around in silent wingless vehicles, powered by a force called Vril, hence the name of the society. Hauschofer knew a great deal about life on Atlantis, almost as though through personal memory, he taught Hitler that the Aryan race was genetically developed by the gods of Atlantis in preparation for the coming disaster, to be a new master race afterwards. He claimed that the Aryans were given higher consciousness and the faculty of logical thought, instead of just super-memory as with the preceding sub-races on Atlantis. 
He convinced Hitler that the pure Germans were descended from this civilization from Ultimathule, sometimes called Hypobora, and were meant to be the nucleus of the new master race. Hauschofer believed that this race of Aryan supermen survived the Atlantean upheavals and still existed somewhere underground in Tibet or the Gobi Desert, and he convinced Hitler to try and make contact with them. From 1926 through 1942, Hauschofer organized annual German expeditions to Tibet. He apparently succeeded in making contact with an underground civilization in Tibet known in occult literature as Agatha, sometime in the early 1930. It is known that Hauschofer met some monks from this underground city, and enlisted them in the Nazi cause. Some literature on this subject describes the monks as adepts of the dark side. They came to Berlin and set up a community. They were later joined by members of the Japanese Green Dragon Society, at the invitation of Hauschofer. In the secret meetings of the Vril Society, attended by Hauschofer, Hitler, and the key members of the Thule Society, a very talented medium by the name of Maria Orsic began to get psychic transmissions in an unknown language, which they were eventually able to decipher. As they continued, it was determined that the messages were coming from two planets in the Aldebaran system comprising the Sumeran Empire. Aldebaran is a huge star in the Taurus constellation thousands of time larger than our own Sun, about 65 light years from Earth. The information channeled by Orsic claimed that the Sumeran Empire consisted of an Aryan or master race, and a subservient slave race and that the Aryans colonized our solar system 500 million years ago when the Aldebaran system became uninhabitable. When they eventually reached Earth, they founded the Sumerian civilization. According to Peter Moon in The Black Sun, as they continued to study the transmissions, the Vril Society discovered that the ancient Sumerian language was identical to that of the Aldebarans and that it was also similar to the German language. Whether or not they materialized in the flesh in the inner sanctum of the Vril Society, or met with the Nazi leaders in the underground city through the mediation of the Tibetan monks, there is no doubt that Hauschofer and Hitler, at least, met with the Ubermanshaw Superman. In a conversation with Hermann Rauskning, the governor of Danzig, about the possibility of creating a new, advanced species of human through breeding, Hitler said, as reported by Rauskning, the new man is living amongst us now. He is here! exclaimed Hitler, triumphantly. Isn't that enough for you? I will tell you a secret. I have seen the new man. He is intrepid and cruel. I was afraid of him. Samuel Mathers, the founder of the Golden Dawn, had a similar encounter. In a manifesto to the members in 1896, he wrote, as to the secret chiefs with whom I am in touch and from whom I have received the wisdom of the Second Order. They used to meet me physically at a time and place fixed in advance. For my part, I believe they are human beings living on this earth but possessed of terrible and superhuman powers. I felt I was in contact with a force so terrible that I can only compare it to the shock one would receive from being near a flash of lightning during a great thunderstorm. Wonder weapons could the secret chiefs or supermen have been extraterrestrials, perhaps currently living on Earth or elsewhere? In light of subsequent developments, such a conclusion seems not unreasonable. Possibly, because of this contact with Hitler, the Nazis were to acquire scientific knowledge and weapon technologies far beyond anything previously seen on Earth. The weapons became known as the Wonderwer for Wonder Weapons. This all seems especially remarkable when it is understood just how much the Nazi inner circle detested science and book knowledge and embraced psychic information and ceremonial magic instead. 
According to Peter Moon, as early as 1919, the combined Thule and Vril societies began work on a time machine which was completed in 1924 and taken to a hiding place in southern Germany. This early development, it is said, resurfaced after the war and was continued 30 years later as the Montauk Project, in an underground base at Montauk Point, Long Island where ex-Nazi scientists were assisted by extraterrestrials. And it was the Vril Society that reportedly developed the first anti-gravity craft, the RFZ-1, as early as 1934. The Society raised its own funds for this development by soliciting donations in German newspapers. This first model crashed and burned, but the RFZ-2, 60 feet in length, flew quite well and was used as a reconnaissance craft and so it came to the attention of SS Chief Himmler. By this time, Hitler was in power and he turned the anti-gravity development project over to the SS, to develop directly with the Vril Society. He himself was more interested in conventional weaponry. By 1939, the SS had developed the RFZ-5, which was renamed to become the famous Hanabu-I, a two-man craft about 35 feet in diameter powered by a Tachin type electrogravitation motor called the Kola Converter. Purported plans for Hanabu I the motor, it was claimed, converted the Earth's gravitational energy into electromagnetic power. The Nazis continually improved on the Hanabu model, culminating in the Hanabu III late in the war. A huge craft, 200 feet in diameter, the Hanabu III, it was said, could reach a speed of 24,000 miles per hour at an altitude of 15,000 feet and could carry 32 passengers. But strangely, the Germans were never able to adapt these incredible flying machines to conventional warfare. It is suggested that they couldn't train the pilots, and that the craft were not maneuverable enough to engage fighter planes in dogfights, and that they couldn't be used as bombers although they could easily reach the U.S. without refueling. The Nazis chose to focus instead on von Braun's robotic rocketry, believing that they could so frighten the civilian population of London with their V-2 flying bombs that they could precipitate a mass movement to surrender. As history makes dear, they severely underestimated the legendary British stiff upper lip. The Nazis also pioneered jet-powered propulsion. The first jet fighter plane in the world, the fearsome Messerschmitt Me 262, could easily have turned the tide of the war if it had lasted several months longer. German scientists were also working on development of nuclear weapons long before America got into the act. Nuclear fission was discovered in 1938 by Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin. The Germans were producing heavy water in Vimorque, Norway in 1943 in preparation for using it to refine plutonium. But Hitler and Albert Speer scuttled the program after chief civilian nuclear scientist Werner Heisenberg failed to sell the project as a feasible way to win the war. Allied soldiers discovered a uranium-based nuclear reactor underground in Hagelosch, Germany, Heisenberg's hometown, and several thousand pounds of uranium buried nearby. The consensus is that Germany would have developed the bomb before the US. If it hadn't been for Hitler's poor judgment in scientific matters, and the sabotage and heavy allied bombardments of technological sites, although some think that Heisenberg, a former protégé of Nobel Prize winning Danish physics Niels Bohr, deliberately diverted his research away from weaponry. Strange as it might sound, the case could be made that German advanced scientific knowledge and weaponry was supplied by extraterrestrials somehow connected with a purported underground civilization in Tibet. Exactly how this information was conveyed is not clear, but some argue that the connection was established through the mediation of Karl Hauschofer, 
and that a group of monks from that underground Tibetan city came to live in Berlin to assist with Hitler's war plans. They were, reportedly, known as the Society of Green Men. There is some evidence to suggest that this situation evolved to the point that aliens were actually working shoulder to shoulder with German scientists. Hitler envisioned a new world order to last a thousand years. With the help of architect Albert Speer he designed grandiose buildings and the monuments to accommodate his new one world Aryan civilization, to be supported by the slave labor of the inferior races. However, it now seems that this reputed alliance with extraterrestrials was a marriage of convenience, since apparently they had a similar goal and, indeed, may have been using Hitler as some kind of straw man to facilitate their intended takeover of the planet. If all that is true, it puts the European war in a totally new light, just one piece in an elaborate worldwide campaign of alien design which included the participation of Japan in order to control the seas. From this perspective, the outbreak of World War II can be viewed as a push by the extraterrestrials to impose a fascist dictatorship of the entire planet, under their control. If that is the case it appears that the planning may have begun in the early years of the 20th century and that Hitler's rise to power was coordinated with Mussolini's in Italy and the emergence of Hideki Tojo in Japan. Such a scenario would help to explain many strange similarities between the three fascist movements, especially the militarization of the governments, and the imposition of elaborate and sophisticated propaganda machines. Propaganda, after all, is nothing more than a form of national mind control, and we suspect that the aliens are very skilled in these techniques. At the close of World War I in 1919, under the terms of the Versailles Treaty, Germany was allowed to keep only 100,000 men in the army and 15,000 in the navy. They were not permitted to have submarines or military aircraft. This situation remained basically stable for the next 14 years until Hitler came to power in 1933 and then, in March of 1935, instituted conscription and renewed military training in open violation of the treaty. To achieve the extravagantly ambitious goal of world conquest, Germany would need a bright new army of young, ruthless, efficient, well-trained stormtroopers numbering in the millions. In 1933 that seemed like an impossible dream, since the army then consisted mainly of 100,000 aging, dispirited veterans of WWI, and some raw recruits. It seemed especially hopeless in view of the depressed economic conditions in Germany at that time. Yet, in September of the very next year, Six months before conscription began, at the Nuremberg Nazi rally of 1934, 160,000 stalwart German soldiers with backpacks and rifles stood silently at attention in precise ranks as Hitler, Heinrich Himmler and Saar Chief Victor Lutz walked down the wide center aisle towards flaming columns bordering a gigantic wreath honoring German soldiers killed in battle. This fantastic scene was captured in the now famous documentary, Triumph of the Will by legendary film photographer Leni Riefenstahl. Where did those 160,000 perfect young soldiers come from? In October of 1935, Hitler supplied the answer to that riddle when he made public that he had kept 21 infantry divisions under wraps in 1934 and he announced that they would now become the core of the new German army, the Wehrmacht. So that's where the 160,000 came from, but where did the 21 divisions come from? An infantry division can be as many as 20,000 troops, so it seems that somehow Miller magically got his hands on an instant army of about 500,000 soldiers with no explanation of where they came from or how they had been trained. 
He announced also that an additional 21 divisions would soon be added. One may be forgiven for wondering just how was it possible for all this to be accomplished only one year after Hitler became Chancellor of Germany? Now that we have evidence of alien involvement in the war preparations, a startling explanation presents itself. It is now believed by many that the aliens have mastered cloning biotechnology, and in fact that the small grey ETs of abduction fame are clones themselves. Could it be possible that Hitler's alien friends presented him with a ready-made million-man army of clone stormtroopers? We have already seen that the planning for World War II probably began in the early part of the century. Was Hitler's army secretly growing up in spaceships or underground cities even as real soldiers were dying by the millions on the battlefields of Europe? Perhaps George Lucas knew more than is commonly believed when, in 2001, he wrote Episode 2 of a Star Wars saga titled Attack of the Clones. When it comes to fantastic possibilities for the Nazi, E.T. connection, though, that is only the beginning. A Nazi moon base according Lo Vladimir Terzisky. The Germans succeeded in reaching the moon sometime in 1942, and established a base on the dark side. Terzisky is a controversial figure in the UFO community, but he has impressive credentials. Lai is a Bulgarian-born engineer and physicist and reportedly is conversant in English, Japanese, Russian and German in addition to his native Bulgarian, and is therefore uniquely able to do research in all these languages. He says, the Germans landed on the moon probably as early as 1942, utilizing their larger exo-atmospheric rocket sources of the Mayeth and Shriva type. The Shriva Walter turbine-powered craft was designed as an interplanetary exploration vehicle. It had a diameter of 60 meters, had 10 stories of crew compartments, and stood 45 meters high. Terzisky claims that after establishing the initial surface base they tunneled underground, and by the end of the war there was a small Nazi research base on the moon. The free energy touch and drive craft of the Hornibu 1 and 2 type were used after 1944 to haul people, materials, sick, and the first robots to the construction site. He claims that the moon has an atmosphere, water and vegetation, and it is possible to get around without space suits, despite NASA propaganda to the contrary. If Terzisky is right, it seems reasonable to suspect that the aliens played a large role in the Nazi moon adventure. While obviously this fantastic accomplishment would have had little wartime strategic value. It should be remembered that, in 1942, the Germans were supremely confident of winning the war, and were projecting their space travel, conquest, plans well ahead into the thousand-year Third Reich. Complex scenarios arguing for consideration of alien involvement in the politics and wars of Earth. Among those offering supposedly detailed information concerning the extraterrestrial intervention factor typical is someone called Branton. All we know about him is that he claims to have been abducted many times since the age of 12, and that his information accords with David Icke and some other such sources. The following is taken from Branton's material. A formal treaty was executed in 1933 between the Nazi Bavarian Intelligence Agency, which eventually became the S.S, and the Greys, an alien race living in underground bases in Tibet and elsewhere in the world, facilitated by the Thule Society. The Greys are said to be from Zeta II Reticuli. The Greys, in turn, it is said, are subservient to the reptilians and are believed to be implanted with biochips to keep them under control. They are mostly a cloned race, 
having lost the ability to reproduce eons ago, due to radioactive fallout from nuclear wars on their home planet. There is a group of about 2,000 original grey prototypes from which the clones are copied. Many abductees have commented on their robotic, totally unemotional behavior. The reptilians are a fierce, tyrannical race from Alpha Draconis, sometimes referred to as reptiloids because they are human-like in basic form, but their skin, it is claimed, is scaly and their faces are lizard-like with vertical slit eyeballs. They are up to 8 feet tall, and very strong. They are considered by some extraterrestrials to be master geneticists, but others claim that they have botched many of their genetic experiments. Their most powerful capability is mind control, and in this they are considered undisputed experts. This accounts for their ability to shape-shift or to take on a human appearance, because they can plant that illusion in the mind of the observer. They are in league with other reptilian races from Rigel Orion and Bellatrix Orion. Together they are referred to as the Draco Orion imperialists, and have taken over many of the star systems in the 21 star cluster in this section of the galaxy, comprising the Draco Orion slash Grey Empire. The Drake Orionites are referred to as interventionists because they boldly seek to enslave other races. Like the fascists that they sponsored, they are cruel and merciless. Their ancient enemies are the humanoid races from Andromeda, Arcturus, Lyra, the Pleiades and Sirius. The main Pleiadian faction is from the planet Hera circling the star Tegeta, one of the Seven Sisters. Taken together, this group of civilizations comprises the Galactic Federation. The Dull Universe is also part of the Federation. The Federation races are non-interventionist in that they believe deeply in freedom, and will never try to influence or persuade other developing races, or to block or violate their right to make free will choices, and, in fact, they seek to assist in spiritual development. The Federation forces on Earth are based under Death Valley and Mount Shasta in California. The Star Wars began when the Draconians attacked Lyra and the Pleiades. Branton says, the stories that contactees tell of the devastating battles and galactic massacres, in almost every case initiated by the collectivist interventionist reptiloids, greys between the two galactic superpowers are integral although controversial elements. While the Draco Greys, it is claimed, gave the Germans fantastic weapons including jet propulsion, rocketry, television-guided missiles, anti-gravity aircraft, nuclear technology, and possibly even a cloned army, that the Allies were not completely without alien assistance. The ETs it is said, gave the Allies one man, Nikola Tesla. It was Tesla, according to this line of argument, who first saw the promise of radar in 1917, and was instrumental in its development and use in the war. Consequently, the British and the US had sophisticated radar defenses deployed early in the war using Tesla's patents while the Germans gave it scant attention, and it was radar that won the Battle of Britain. Tesla and Roosevelt met in 1917 when FDR was Secretary of the Navy, and Roosevelt was very impressed with Tesla's genius. In 1936, according to some reports, he put Tesla in charge of the Invisibility Project, working with the Navy. In 1940, as the story goes, they succeeded in making a ship disappear in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Whether or not invisibility was secretly used in the war is unknown. Tesla also invented, it is claimed, particle beam weaponry which he publicly referred to as the Death Ray. It was not, it seems, developed soon enough to use in the war, but satellite-based versions have since, it is believed become potent weapons in both US and Soviet arsenals. 
Tesla is also said to have been offered a large amount of money to go and work for Germany but that he refused, and that he remained an American patriot to the end. Tesla often made mention of his off-planet friends, say some. Sometime in the mid-thirties, they say, he arranged a meeting between Roosevelt and Pleiadian representatives, which supposedly took place on a ship in the Atlantic. Within the alien tracking internet community it is believed that some sort of agreement came out of that meeting, and that a Federation representative may have consulted at the Pentagon for most of the war. Sometime in late 1944, the story goes, when it became apparent that they had lost the war, the Germans moved the main components of their anti-gravity aircraft technology and their top scientists to their subterranean base in the Antarctic called Neuschkabenland, which they had been preparing since 1938. It is suspected that an extraterrestrial base had already existed there and that it was inhabited by their compatriots, the Drake Orionites. The Germans had been assiduously patrolling and defending the sea lanes to Antarctica since early in the war as they moved men and materials there in U-boats. They stationed their largest battle cruiser, the Graf Spee, off the coast of Argentina sometime in 1939 and they were known to be sinking even merchant vessels sailing in those waters. If true, this might explain why the Allied armies found only superficial remnants of flying disc development as they overran Germany, and none of the important scientists. Could Antarctica have been the destination of the so-called Lost Battalion of 250,000 German troops that could never be accounted for? Could these have been perhaps carefully kept and maintained cloned stormtroopers, to be used as genetic prototypes for the new Wave Act? By April of 1945, the European war was winding down as the Allied troops converged on Berlin. At that point, it is claimed, all the anti-gravity technology and scientists had been transferred to Neuschwedenland. It was from that Antarctic base that the Germans decided to launch a mission to Mars, jointly with the Japanese. Vladimir Terzisky says, according to the authors of the underground German documentary movie from the Thule Society, the only produced craft of the Horniba III type, the 74-meter diameter naval warfare dreadnought, was chosen for the most courageous mission of this whole century, the trip to Mars. The trip reportedly took almost eight months because the large Andromeda-type Tachin drives were turned off immediately after the escape from the Earth's gravitation, and the ship coasted the rest of the way in an elliptical orbit. Terzisky believes that the crew probably numbered in the hundreds. The huge craft crash landed on Mars in January. 1946 severely damaging the Tachin drives and making return impossible, but according to the documentary, the crew knew from the beginning that it was probably a suicide mission. Terzisky says, the radio message with the mixed news was received by the German underground space control center in Neuschwedenland and by their research base on the moon. Evidently, with the war on Earth lost. The Axis partners decided to position themselves off-planet in readiness for the next round, and the advent of the Fourth Reich. All the chroniclers of World War II agree that the German soldiers were very tough and courageous, and almost robotic in terms of efficiency. They obeyed orders without question, even in the face of certain death. As the Blitzkrieg rolled over Europe, they could do no wrong. It was their insensitivity to human suffering that made the atrocities in Russia, and the concentration camps. The Einsatzgruppen were taken from the ranks of the Wehrmacht, possible. Maybe, though, it wasn't that they were sadistic, maybe they just didn't care. But, on the other hand, they showed no resourcefulness whereas the British and American soldiers could be relied on to come up with ideas even in the worst situations.
Ultimately, the thinking soldier with a heart prevailed. Apparently, the moral of the story is, if you expect to win a war with an army of clones, you better have someone with great intelligence directing them, and Hitler just didn't fill the bill. When it came to intellect, he was no match for the combined brain power of Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and an allied army of citizen soldiers from free societies. We shall never surrender. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. But I do ask, but I do ask every publisher, every editor, and every newsman in the nation to re-examine his own standards and to recognize the nature of our country's peril. In time of war, the government and the press have customarily joined in an effort based largely on self-discipline to prevent unauthorized disclosures to the enemy. In times of clear and present danger, the courts have held that even the privileged rights of the First Amendment must yield to the public's need for national security. Today, no war has been declared. And however fierce the struggle may be, it may never be declared in the traditional fashion. Our way of life is under attack. Those who make themselves our enemy are advancing around the globe. The survival of our friends is in danger. And yet no war has been declared no borders have been crossed by marching troops. No missiles have been fired. If the press is awaiting a declaration of war before it imposes the self-discipline of combat conditions, then I can only say that no war ever posed a greater threat to our security. If you are awaiting a finding of clear and present danger, then I can only say that the danger has never been more clear and its presence has never been more imminent. It requires a change in outlook, a change in tactics, a change in missions by the government, by the people, by every businessman or labor leader, and by every newspaper. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. It conducts the Cold War in short. With a wartime discipline, no democracy would ever hope or wish to match. Nevertheless, every democracy recognizes the necessary restraints of national security. And the question remains whether those restraints need to be more strictly observed if we are to oppose this kind of attack as well as outright invasion.